Mr. Perrier, let me ask you now. Uh, you know, it's interesting because you've, you've always looked at, uh, at these opportunities as being able to operate in a multipolar world as opposed to the erstwhile matrix of how investors looked at these opportunities. Uh, you know, ahead of your IPO in 2015, you very categorically stated that your endeavor would be to grow your business and your aspiration was to go into emerging markets, so to speak. What's the experience been like four years down the line today as you look at some of these markets that you've done joint ventures in, as you look at expanding in these markets? What's been the big lesson that you've learned so far? Um, firstly, uh, 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 what is uh, Amundi, the company that uh, I manage? We are uh, uh, an asset manager managing 1.5 trillion euros and we are the, the first in Europe and the seventh in the world. And uh, in the top ten in the world, you have nine Americans and uh, mm -hmm. which is the European leader. And uh, a preliminary remark. What is a strategy? A strategy is not to define what we would like to be, but uh, the fields where we have uh, a good uh, probability to be successful. And the strategy which I've defined is uh, to be a leader in Europe and uh, in Asia. Mm. Uh, Asia and also uh, Middle East. Wh why we have chosen these countries? Firstly, because when you look at the distribution of savings and debt in the world, uh, I very often say that uh, the savings are in the East and the debt are in the West. <laughs> uh, and so that uh, the net inflows of savings for example, in Asia is uh, very strong and uh, uh, today we manage uh, 200 billion euros in Asia and they have set an objective of 300 billion euros. Uh, secondly, uh, when we are speaking of uh, emerging ma market or countries, mm. it's a word which is non-relevant. Uh, today, uh, uh, the GDP of all these so-called emerging countries is more than 50% of the global GDP in the yeah. world. Yeah. That means that another definition would to say we have emerging countries and the rest of the world. Mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, the situation of all these countries is very different. The situation uh, not the same in China, India, Japan, um, Korea, Russia. Mm. Uh, but the common point of all these countries is that their pace of development is higher than uh, the other, and that in some cases they have competitive edge due to the, uh, the change in uh, technology. Mm. You know, the, the new economy is an economy of information. Yes. Uh, and with this, um, the, the main resource is human resource mm. and education. And if you consider that uh, each country uh, is going to this, uh, my conviction is that uh, in the next 30 years, yes. uh, the, the distribution of GDP mm. will be not very different of the distribution of the global population in the world. Yeah. Uh, let me get to uh, Mr. Royasa. If I could ask you about the B20's recommendations that have been made to, uh, to the G20, and again, the B20 is about 25 different countries uh, presenting their point of view. Hopefully, uh, more than just being appreciated by the G20, the hope is that they will, in fact, be uh, implemented and executed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of working groups that the B20 has. Uh, uh, you look at SME development, you look at digital technology, you look at SMEs, uh, you look at fostering investment. Uh, I think one of the big focuses uh, of the B20 uh, is to ensure that the world continues to be open, it continues to be inclusive, that uh, multilateral agencies like the WTO continue to be relevant. What concerns you today? And from a banking and finance perspective, you know, in order for us to have continuity, in order for us to have stability, uh, what is the role that, for instance, the B20 uh, could play uh, to ensure that we do achieve that? The uh, Troika fixed three uh, priorities. The first one is education and employment, uh, financial growth and infrastructure, and uh, sustainable food systems, this is something for the countries that have uh, a primary and industrial sector very important in the, uh, at the food industry. I am the head of the food industry uh, in, in my own country. Then, in the case of finance, the, the key question is, our main goal is making infrastructure and asset class mm. uh, with this 
significantly increasing the flow of private capital to infrastructure, and with three main objectives. First, bridging the infrastructure gap. The emerging countries, those who want to be developed countries, need to cover that gap. And certainly, you need infrastructure and, and you need finance, financing this yeah. gap, and that's clear a priority. The, the second one is access to affordable housing, mm. because we need to stabilize societies. We do, if we do not have cohesive societies, uh, you, you can have a good economy, but a, a bad political system, unstable, then finally you do not have uh, a economic stability also. And finally, a, and finally financial cross-border regulation. We have more than uh, 200 people at the, uh, active members, and uh, many uh, thousands of, uh, of the members are uh, CEOs or CFOs of companies. And I can tell you that in the financial uh, uh, task force is very active. We do not have uh, the conclusion yet. We met uh, not only locally, but in Washington, Uri and the IMF, mm -hmm. and the World Bank Spring meeting. And now we, uh, next Monday will be in our OECD in Paris. We, uh, all the, the task forces will meet. And, uh, and certainly, uh, we are paving the way for the conclusions. What, what we want is to have very clear, concrete, easy to implement, certainly there is no one fit, uh, one fit uh, yeah. all response, but, mm. but clearly that we can have conclusions that could be applicable in general terms and, and, and susceptible of a follow-up. Mm. Because if not, there will be some general comments. I think that, and I want to turn to the first point. Mm. And the first point is, great, certainly. I strongly believe in multilateralism. Mm. I'm absolutely against unilateralism. Certainly, countries like mine will be a victim of unilateralism. I don't want to be a victim. I want to be a, an actor. And uh, that with this conviction, we participate in that. Then we think that the WTO has a, uh, a really a strong role, uh, uh, and we need to have a very, uh, a, a, a very clear uh, a definition of its role, mm -hmm. and also the adaptation of rules taking into account the digital economy couldn't be outside, yeah. need to be inside, and certainly a mechanism in order to solve conflict. I ask you about the role that you see for a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, you know, $12 billion of assets under management for you currently today. What's the role that you see specifically from a financial services perspective as, the, uh, as these markets grow out? Thank you very much. Let me talk a little bit about sovereign wealth fund. They have three major characteristics. They are owned by government, mostly, or if not all of them, they're long-term in nature, uh, and what they do is they're long-term in nature, and they seek growth. So when, they, when that is a characteristic, that means, you know, they, we look around everywhere. We have many mandates to invest locally and internationally. So when we go, you talked about, you know, all these political issues. Mm. As a sovereign wealth fund, we're a long-term investor, five, seven, ten years. We look beyond all of these tension that comes and goes. So we are a long-term investor. What we provide is we provide long-term funding for businesses that need to grow. We invest in businesses that are commercially viable, that have the fundamental for growth. Let me give you two examples. Healthcare is going to grow. Population is increasing. So we know that's a good sector to be in. Education is a sector that population is growing. It's fundamentally, it's a good sector to be in. It touches the people. So these are the sectors that we really invest in it, and we think it is long term, it is a viable sector that we go in. So, and what we do is, these are businesses that are there, they need help, they need capital to improve them. Private equities comes in, short period, and go out and disrupt the businesses. Sovereign wealth fund are long term investors yeah. that are, uh, give the business that assurances. And as I said earlier at the beginning, we are owned by the government. So we are very regulated, so in our home countries. So whenever we go in the businesses, we bring with us two baggages. First of all, we want to see a viable business. We'd like to see corporate governance, and we want to see transparency. To me, all of these are good things that really comes in once mm -hmm. we bring in money. There is a lot of potential in many areas. We don't look at emerging market or non-emerging market. We look at these fundamentals. And if the fundamentals are there, we are there. We pick the business that are there. And I think, you know, talking about the Russian economy, we looked at it. And we saw all those positive fundamentals. And we are here because we think those fundamentals are here. We talked earlier about you know, the regulation of the banking sector. 
maybe as a banker, it, it gives him a bit of hard time. But as an investor, it gives me some sort of comfort that I know mm. a higher bar is being imposed on them. It's not nice for them, but it gives me that comfort. <laughs> and I think these are the things that we look at it, and it is sovereign wealth fund has been really a very, very, very positive element, and really, and it gives me personally great pleasure when I see I'm investing in business that really improving the life of people, mm. touching the people, education, healthcare. Would you would you look at investing in the financial services space in any form? You spoke about education and healthcare. Would that be an area of opportunity? Mobile banking or any of these new uh, uh, areas that we spoke of? We we do, and I think you know we are there in that sectors. And there is one element coming. Maybe we didn't touch about it. It's technology. Uh, unfortunately, I think technology is coming, and it will be a very disruptive force. We have to adjust to it. It's like how we have to deal with the younger generation, they are disruptive. <laughs> Technology is the same thing. We have to get used to it, and we have to implement it in our business.